Pesach, the holiday of the birth of the Jewish nation. We left Egypt, became independent from uh, the slavery from Egypt. And then Shavuot, receiving the Torah, which reveals the inner content, the essence, the neshama, the soul of the Jewish people. And so too, between those two days, and parallel to them, are two modern days of celebration. We have Yom Atzmut and Yom Yerushalayim, Independence Day and Yom Yerushalayim, the 5th of Iyar. Right? There's Pesach and Shavuot, and between them is Yom Atzmut and Yom Yerushalayim, which also Yom Atzmut commemorates the modern rebirth of the Jewish nation after 2,000 years to return to national uh, independence. And Yerushalayim symbolizes the essence, the, the inner content. The Yerushalayim is the right ki mitzion, they say Torah, Dvar Hashem Yerushalayim, the word of God goes from Yerushalayim. That's the spiritual content. So these two holidays that are inside, between, and not by chance apparently, the uh, Pesach and Shavuot, in between them we have Yom Atzmut and Yom Yerushalayim. And Yom Zikron and Yom Shavuot. Also, Before. we'll get to that. Yeah. yeah, but I'm saying the two parallels to the national independence is Pesach and Yom Atzmut, and the modern version of it, and Yom Yerushalayim and Shavuot are also parallel. But we'll see there's more to talk about that. But you're also, it's also true. We also commemorate the, a week before Yom Atzmut is the, I'll give you actually the sheets. You can pass out these sheets and see that I put on the top here that we also commemorate, like David said, the uh, Yom HaShoah is on the 27th of Nisan, a week before Yom HaTzmaut. Anyone know why that was uh, determined? Why had they picked the choose established the 27th of Nisan? The 27th of Nisan, last a few days ago, we had the commemorated the Yom HaShoah, the of the Yom HaShoah, the Gvura, the courage, the Holocaust and the courage. Was the day when the uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was? Okay, right. The day of the 1943, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So to commemorate also the, um, not just the, the destruction, but also the uh, the Gvura, the courage. Uh, and Independence Day, as you know, as you see on the sheet, of the 5th of VR. The question is, what I wrote here, is this juxtaposition accidental at these, a week before the Yom, the negative side, so to speak, the destruction and the rebirth. So there's an interesting Midrash, Midrash Tehillim, you see on the sheet, the, the tealing that we say every morning, right after Ashrei, the second Ashrei, in Uvalitzion, there's chapter 20 in Tehillim. It says here, right, Dvarachar, Yancha Hashem Yom Tzara, God will answer you in the day of trouble. The rabbis give a metaphor here, Mashal La'avu Ben Shayu Malchim Baderech. The parable of a father and son that were walking on the road. The son gets tired, they're walking, walking, walking. And the son, Amar uh, Av, the son turns to his father and says, Medina. When are we going to get to the Medina? So here the Medina, it means the, the city, the metropolis. But it holds out the word that we use today for the state, like Medina. It's a city, no? Medina. Okay, I said metropolis, a city, yeah, right. Yeah. So, but here, like the son says, when are we going to get to the destination, to the city? But the, the terminology is, when are we getting to the Medina? Amarlo Bni, my son, he turns to him and says, My son, you, I'll give you a sign. Siman ze I'll give you a sign to have in your hands. Everyone got a sheet at once? You have a, There's more. Im ra'ita beit ha'kvarot lefanecha, if you see the cemetery before you, harea medina krovalacha. And you should know that the medina is soon to follow. That says the medina, this juxtaposition of the city, right? The building of the city, the cemetery is usually outside the city walls. To the uh, jurisdiction, so to speak. So here he says, the, the rabbis say that when you see the cemetery, you should know that the Medina is Krova, is, is about to come. So Hashem says to Yisrael, to the Jewish people, If you see troubles that um, come to you often, more and more troubles, you should know that then soon you'll be redeemed. As it says, He's like, I like the, the, the answer you, they, that God answers you in the days of trouble. There's also another Midrash that follows uh, in Shemot Rabbah, with the second source there, that, again, G God gave signs to Yaakov in Breshit 28. It says, Vayaz Aracha, your children will be like the dust of the earth. That's the verse. And the rabbis explain, when your children reach the Afar Art, when they become like dust of the earth, in that hour, at that time, then, right, the juxtaposition of the verses in the Torah, from the, from the dust, 
you'll rise up and then you'll spread north and east and south, etc. And when you're a mom, God will uplift you. So here we see this juxtaposition. We learned this principle throughout the year a few times, what the Maharal calls the Heder Kodem Havaya, the absence that precedes the existence. Or what we did on Pesach, the, the order that the Mishnah says, how do you organize the, the night of the Leila Seder, the Haggadah? Matchilim Be, we start with, what do the rabbis say? We start with Gnut, right? All with questions, Yafe. But the rabbis say, the Mishnah says, Matchilim, we start with the, how do you say Gnut, the opposite of praise. We start with the negative, and we finish up with Shvach, with the praise. Mm-hmm. You start with it, why? That we start with Avadim Ayinu, right? We were slaves, and then God took us out to be free. In other words, you start with the negative. So there's a lot to talk about that principle of um, the negative that precedes the positive. There are simple explanations like you appreciate, uh, like again, Yom HaZikaron, like the, I have today, like also the night before Yom HaTzma'ut, the day before is the Yom HaZikaron, the memorial for the fallen soldiers, which this year they said came out to uh, 24,068. Again, counting from the first 1850, whatever, at the beginning of the Jewish settlement here, not from the state, 24,000. Um, that gave their lives you know, to defend the, the Jewish settlement in the state. Nevertheless, the, again, this juxtaposition of the, some that, that don't like that, that we have this day of memorial, they go from sadness, they lower the flag, and then Yom HaTzimut raise the flag. But there's a significance to that. In other words, it's, they didn't do it for that reason, but it's not for, uh, for nothing. In other words, this, this connection of, the first of all, appreciating the, the price that you paid or recognizing the price that we paid for independence makes you more appreciated, whatever. But it's also the much, there's a lot of deeper concepts of this, the negative preceding the positive. You know, when bigger forces of life have to come out, there is like the chicken, the, the chicken, the egg. There's more forces that breaks the egg. It's you're breaking, it's destruction, it's a negative. But it's an indication that there's more life that can't be contained anymore in this smaller shell. It be, it's an indication of greater forces of life. Sometimes the breaking, the rabbis explain how the, the negative, like the Maral explains, the negative that precedes the positive is due to the fact that there's a new level, a greater level that has to come out. The previous level no longer is, stands, it can, it can remain. There's a breaking of the old, the burning of the bridges, so to speak, in order to force out and to bring out and to express a bigger force. But that, um, there's a lot more to talk about. I think we've did, done so through the year. But now I wanted to get to more... Um, uh, in Yom Ha'atzma'ut, he's saying <coughs> of thanks to Hashem <laughs> and why we say thanks and what are we appreciating. So as you see on the sheet, you have Tehillim number 118, is from the Hallel, right? The, and we say, we said it this morning also for Rosh Chodesh, but we say on, on Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Nagila ve'nismacha, this is the day that God has done, Nagila ve'nismacha bo, we will rejoice and be glad in it. So the rabbis ask, what is in it? In it, it's in Hebrew, bo, is in it, in him. Is it in God or in the day? So this is the day that God has done. We are happy, bo. Bo is in that God or in the day that God has made. But the rabbis say that it's both. That it's referring to both. In the Zohar, the rabbis say. And they're both the same thing. We're, we're appreciating the day that God has done. We recognize that God has made this day something special. In our case, as we'll see, what God has done in this day to the victory and the, the returning of Jewish state after 2,000 years, the, the end of the exile, the rabbis say that there's no, in, in the Gemara, in Brachot, page 34, there's no difference between this world and the days of the Mashiach. What does that mean, Shibud Malchiyot? The subordination to the nation. In other words, the only difference between this world that we know it and the days of the Mashiach, the Messianic era, the cutoff point, the... the Crossing over to this new level is the abolishment of the subordination to the nations. In other words, Jewish independence, Jewish freedom. So this is a very special day, but again, we remember and we'll see that what God has done, who has done all this for us, it's not the, our doing alone. But that's my next question here I put down, that why are we happy on Yom Matzmut and Yom Yerushalayim? Is it, if you see it's in English now, you can read those who don't know the Hebrew. Are we appreciating the might and exceptional self-sacrifice of the paratroopers throughout the bitter struggle, how they fought like lions and bathed in blood, presented their glorious prize to the nation? In other words, it's our doing. We're thanking God. Wow, what amazing victory and the, the strength of the soldiers. Or the miracles that God did, 
how the virtues and the wonders of God we merit to return and cleave to Jerusalem in the heart of all of Israel. Um, we met, there was an interview with Golda Meir that she said she was called to Ben-Gurion before the, right before the announcing of the state. Ben-Gurion called her in and he says, I can't sleep, I can't sleep at night. The, um, the amount, how do you say, the estimate, I've seen what the weapons we have, we can't declare a state, we have no way to defend ourselves. Besides, you know, the outnumbers and the threat with everyone there, they throw us into the, uh, into the sea, they said, which is uh, the only option available, right? We were surrounded by all the sides, east, uh, east, north, and south, and the only way was the sea, the only refuge, so to speak. So they said they were going to throw us into the sea, which we saw what they did on the omen, the day the announcement of uh, Yom Atzimut, the day before, you know, what they did in Kfar Tzion, when they took over the uh, settlement of Kibbutz in Kfar Tzion, they slaughtered all the people that were there. Um, so we knew what they were about to do and wanted to do in Ben-Gurion. We don't have the, we don't have the way to defend them. The British are leaving. And the UN said they'll become, they will be a, a protectorate of the UN. We see how they defend the world, right? We can rely on them. He said, what are we going to do? We can't. And the truth is the vote for statehood was only by two. In other words, the majority of two. Other people that wanted the state, whatever, but it wasn't realistic. I think it's also the person who's supposed to be the Minister of Finance. We don't have any money. For three months, we can last. Another way, the embargo. The kids said, we have nothing. There's no way to proclaim a state. And yet, the, we got up, and this, we'll see, that this miracle of uh, proclaiming the state, declaring the state, in spite of all the odds, it's against all the logic, and the miracle, obviously, the victory, the success that stemmed from that. So the question is, so what are we happy for? What God did or what we did? Like the miracles that God did, he... We, the, all these millions of enemies surrounding us in this small, fledgling state that wasn't, had nothing to protect itself, no military experience and, and studies and whatever. We came from the Holocaust. People came off the boats and they gave them right, the seltzer bottles, all the stories of the seltzer bottles from the planes to make it sound like a bomb. We have, they dropped these seltzer bottles. I mean, shoosh, so the people were afraid. They were, these miracles. So again, is it the miracles or what we did? The bravery of the, the courage of the soldiers. And... I'll give the next sheet. So what's the oh, 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 that's the next sheet. Come on, baby. <laughs> now you can read the next sheet. I have to do it quickly here and pass them out. Wait, I have a question. Uh, so there's 27 Nissan and then what's the ER? The 5th of ER. Fifth, uh-huh. That was the declaration of the state. And why was it in the 5th of ER? Why not? The truth is, that night was supposed to be the end of the mandate. How much is the rest sheet? At midnight. It was Friday. Wait, so wait, there's two cheats here. This is number two. Number two. We got number, three. Okay, number three, give it back. Oh, yeah. So you can wait. I'll give you more of number two. Here's, here's number two. Yeah, I hope. Uh, the fifth of ER, in other words, the fourth, it was supposed to be the that midnight was the end of the British uh, the mandate. They were leaving. And instead of waiting for Friday night, they declared the state win on Friday afternoon. Why? To avoid desecrating Shabbat. To their credit, the secular state, the secular people, you might say, the people criticize. But the holiday was determined for Hey ER to avoid uh, the desecration of Shabbat. And from there, Ben Gurion, I think, went from there to walk to the shul and dab on Friday night in the neighboring shul in Tel Aviv. Uh, and also today, this week, as you know, the, we're not celebrating on the 5th of ER. It's called the Mugdam, right? It's, it's early, made one day earlier, so it should be on Thursday instead of Shabbat Friday. So not, again, not to desecrate Shabbat and all the celebrations. So the consideration for the holiness of Shabbat is innate in the Jewish people, even the, so to speak, what we call the secular, but we'll talk about that. So what I asked David, what's with your question? Was it God's doing or our efforts or are the two contradictory? No, Who I'm says they're... The so not... Oh, how are they in step? If it's either God or us, who's doing it? It's both. It's both. So we have to understand how. So that's what it says here. Again, we've studied this. Uh, we talked about this topic of hishtadlut uh, bitachon, faith in God and human efforts. Are they contradictory? Again, because if you believe in God, the more you do that shows that you don't believe in God, that he'll do it for you. You're supposed to wait and let him do. Or... Uh, like I said, the more there was it is this opinion, this we'll talk about, it. we spoke about this development of this learned helplessness we spoke about 
in the exile that indeed the more you do, uh, the, the more you believe, the less you do. You know the introduction in, in Monim Smecha, but he writes also how this view of sit back and wait. We have to wait, let God do whatever. So we talked about how that developed. But here the Ran, excuse me, before the Ran on this verse, but in Dvarim chapter 8, it says, and this is a verse that is quoted by people that talk about uh, like the soldiers, that uh, the IDF, whatever we captured or whatever, the, the Kotel, freed the Kotel in 1967, the Six-Day War. And there's a group of, um, what's called ultra-Orthodox, they call them, uh, that we don't go to the Kotel because uh, it was by these IDF. We believe in God. We're waiting for God. And it's, uh, you're not supposed to push the hand of God and do These soldiers are captured. We don't want to give any uh, legitimacy to this human capturing. Oh, so that's this verse. But they use the verse, it says, that you'll say that it's my hand and my power that has gotten me this victory. So the question is, are you supposed to say, are you not allowed to say that? In other words, it is my strength. Like people said, we did it. We did it. Look what we did. Look at the wonders of our great soldiers and our Air Force and our Army. You see, look at how batting, how do you say, patting themselves on the back. Yeah. Uh, that is our, we did it all. And that's what the verse tells you, to, uh, that you'll say this statement of, it is me, I've done it all, and forgetting the source. But look what the verse is. Look at the original verse, and then we'll see. What's your name again? What Ariel. Ariel said. So we'll see first the, the verse. It says, take heed lest you forget God, and you've eaten and satisfied, and you have built fine houses, and you come to Israel, and you built, and your heart is exalted, and you forget God. And you say in your heart, my strength and the might of my hand has achieved all this wealth. You'll hear it. They, they, I have done all this. So what does the Torah say about that? Is it bad to say it or not? But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the strength to get the wealth. So it is wrong to say that I got the, it's my strength that brought me the success or the victory. Or you have to know that God gave you the victory. What does it say in the verse? What did God give you? Strength to get wealth. So who, so who, what is the direct source of the, the wealth or the success or the victory? Yeah. Hashem? You put in the effort, but who gives you the strength to fulfill this effort? Right. This but I said, the you? verse says that I said my strength got the wealth. I did the success. I did the victory. So does the next verse say that you're not supposed to say that it's your strength? No. What does the verse no. say? You Look exactly what the word. Effort to accomplish something. Right. The strength that we receive. Hashem. Right. So, whose strength did it? Whose strength got the success? Your strength. Yeah. So, it's right to say it's your strength. But remember one thing: what Ariel said. Where did you get the strength from? It doesn't say, "My strength got it," and the source. No, no, no. You're wrong. It's God's strength who got this victory. It doesn't say that. It is indeed your strength. But who gave you the strength? In other words, you are the direct cause. But who gave you the? Who's above that? Who's the roots? The root cause. And that is how, as you see, the Ron explains it. But I put in the middle here this question of who claims it was the strength of the army. In other words, on one hand, the seculars say it was our strength. We don't believe in a God. We, it's our, right, our victory, our strength. We did it all without a God. Right? They don't say that our strength is from God. And the, the, the irony is that there's some religious people that I said uh, that unfortunately say the same thing, that indeed it was the army that did it. And therefore, we don't want to accept it, or whatever. We don't believe in it. You can't participate because it was the army doing it and not God's doing. In other words, they both agree, ironically, that it was not God. One, because he doesn't believe in a God. And one that says, eh, I'm waiting for God. In other words, I don't want any in between. Which, as we've learned that we discussed, remember the Radak, the famous Radak in Tilim 146, that we say every day in the, after Ashrei, chapter 146 in Tilim, that God, in the words of the Radak, um, that God gives ooh, the same idea here, but um, ah, only unto God is salvation, but He gives, He brings it about through man. But He brings it about through man. He uses human agents. In other words, it's God. But what does God mean? It's miraculous, it's supernatural, and man just sit back and do nothing, and God does it? Or God does it, indeed. God does do miracles. There is such a thing. But also God works. So the Radak says there that God works. How does he bring the redemption? And he brings down the examples there. The first temple, the second temple, and they're coming back in the future. What we're going to talk about. He, says he brings it about through man. 
through uh, through Ben Gurion, through uh, Balfour Declaration, through Balfour, through Ben Gurion, whatever. All these are agents. Where do they get their power from? Hashem. So don't just look at the agents and say that's it. It's either man or God. It's man, like you said. It's not contradictory. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, but the point interesting is like the story of Gideon, right? You see, like when they go to war. Not, not per se like when, when Hashem make them with all the people, but it's interesting that when they go to war, that Gideon say, you do it for Hashem, but also for Gideon. So you see like, it's like even, he, he get like, for the humans, you know, you... No, so but he said, Lech Koch Chavazed, he says there, Gideon, that he's doing it for your name's sake. He says there, that the rabbis say, Lech they do it, go out and you'll succeed because of what you recognize, that God's name is at stake here. The battle isn't for your name. It says there explicitly that um, the verse says that what they do, that they were miracles from Egypt. What about now? What they're going to say that you left? The... Anyway, what the rabbis say there, the Midrash will bring that down at some point, hopefully, that Lech B'Kocho Chazet says in the next verse, go with your power of that you have just said. What did you say? That recognizing that it's not a private thing. This is the, the name of God is at stake. But that, again, we, we'll get to, we'll talk about. But here, it's the same idea, that here the recognizing the irony is, like I said, that these people that the secular don't believe in a God, so they, it's all my doing. But the religious, that no, everything is from Hashem. When you stub your toe, the Gemara says, you take out the wrong coin, the Gemara says, that's a, from Hashem. Everything is from Hashem. But after 2,000 years, this amazing victory, the Jews coming back to the land, returning to independence after 2,000, <laughs> that hasn't been in the, the economy, the returning of Torah, the, everything, all the fulfillment of all the prophecies we've been studying, Yechezko 36, 37, the stages of redemption, the physical redemption and the spiritual, all these... No, that's Ben Gurion and, and, and Herzl. I'm waiting for God. <laughs> so who, who is giving all the things? They're recognizing that these are human agents. Indeed, they are human agents. The Ramban says that everything is miraculous. The, sometimes God does what we call revealed miracles, sets aside the laws of nature, that it's only God, so to speak. And there's usually the way that God runs is the miracle, what he, the Ramban calls the hidden miracles. We see these stirring, that he works through history, through nature, through human efforts, and all that, like the Radak says, he brings it about, indeed the redemption is from God, but he brings it about through man. But here, to get to this verse, what Ariel said, look at the Ran, one of the classic commentators of the, the Talmud and the giants of the Rishonim, the Ran, is the book of Drashot, the Rashot Ran, it's a family, they translated to English recently. The Drashot Ran, number 10, it says, the intention here is that to point out that although it is quite true that certain people are naturally equipped for certain roles rather than others. It is, for example, some people are more ready to grasp wisdom, some are more fitted to amass wealth. So in this respect, the rich man is entitled to claim that my strength and the might of my hand have achieved this wealth. It is indeed his, his power, his strength, his ingenuity. It's a little bit disturbing. It, you, you are entitled to say that it's my strength. Again, those there's so that quote this verse as it's forbidden to say it's our power and my strength. You can't say that. That's against that's heresy. Here the Ran says, no, you are allowed to say that. Because God does, you know, you do have some people are more equipped, more military uh, expertise and more uh, economic and more Torah. You are allowed to say it is my strength, have achieved this wealth. Nevertheless, you must bear in mind what? The one who endowed him with this nature and this attribute. It is your strength, it is your attribute, it is your powers. And you're supposed to use them. But remember who gave them. They're not from you and you alone. You are a, a vehicle. You are a messenger, a shaliach, to bring about God's good in the world and his name in the world and, and beauty and light and energy and positivity and, and, and redemption to the world. And you were given certain powers to do so. So not to use them is the opposite. It's heresy. God gave you these God-given powers to use, to bring blessing to the world. Your unique blessing. Everyone has their unique contribution to bring. Not waiting for God, he'll bring it. No, but it's supposed to come through you. That's what our whole existence is about. So you're supposed to say, I have the strength, and it's my strength that did it. But remember who gave you the strength. Therefore, and he learns it out from the verse, the run. Therefore, the expression used is, but you shall remember God who gives you the strength to achieve the wealth. It doesn't say God gives you the wealth. God gave you the military victory. Right, he skips you. It's just God and the victory. No, God gives you the strength, and your strength got the victory. So it is your strength, but again, you're only, how do you say, the second state. In other words, there's a source before you. And that some people forget, and that's not good. But the fact is that your strength is indeed the vehicle that God gave you. We mentioned the Midrash, it says how the Sifri, the rabbis say in a few places, this is the blessing, and all that you shall do. 
God will bless you in all that you do. So the rabbis say, they stopped the afterwards, God will bless you. The rabbis stop the Midrash. Um, even if you sit back idly with your hands, you do nothing. No, Bechol Hashem and all that you should do. God's blessing will be forthcoming upon your doing and acting. And then His blessing will work and bless your efforts. Like people say in English, whatever, God blesses those. Uh, how does it go? Uh, blesses those who bless themselves. No, 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 it's something like God that. Helps those, helps those who help themselves, right? <laughs> that was it. But the rabbis say way before, the Torah says it, God's blessing will be Bechol Hashem and all that you should do. And you have to do. That's not heresy. Again, when you recognize that, then what you're doing is in order to fulfill what God gave you that power to do what he wants you to do, to bring good, to bring positive uh, help and benefit and charity and, and to help the world, to add good to the world, not to have your power and to use it improperly. If you recognize that it's God-given power, you use it for the gift that he gave you for the reason for which he gave it to you. To, like I said, to add good to the world, to bring God's name, to bring light to the world. But that's what the Ron says here. It doesn't say God gave you the wealth. God gave you the victory directly. The means of obtaining wealth is indeed the strength or attribute implanted by God in man's nature. Therefore, the Torah says that although your strength is directly the final cause, right, the directly responsible for attaining greatness, remember the one who endows you with that strength, the Holy One, blessed be he. So too, although you're Barbanel, one of the famous commentators, Rabbi Yitzchak Barbanel, uh, explains the verse and um, etc. Um, so now, those who have page three can keep it. Those who don't have page three can now receive it. I'm doing it quickly because there's a lot to do and the time is limited. So one second, we have a lot to do. Quick, I'm sorry, we only have. A, there's more. There's a lot of room for discussion. We'll have to um, try to limit it and do it quickly. In the top of Shars three here, our strength that I might have achieved all this. Yes. Our inspiring youth brought us this victory through our courage, and yes, in other words, it is our strength. But again, who gave us that strength? That we'll talk about soon. But here, there's an article here. It was written, translated by Ravelli Sedan. I very I mean, simply put the clear ideas. But from where did we draw these exceptional powers, this strength, this courage? Where did it come from? A regular estimation of the military strength of a nation must take into account its military background, its tradition, economy, population, territory, etc. Et we are faced with 2,000 years of exile, 2,000 years of statelessness, the absence of any form of defense force. We are neither wealthy nor we possess political links which might put a limitless supply of arms. It's not like the European Union supplies pours into us like other places here around us, our enemies that are supplied with uh, millions of dollars, etc. We are few in, like I said, we don't have any weapons. We, it was amazing. The miracle was that Czechoslovakia, right? everyone turned us down and then we got weapons from Czechoslovakia. Uh, yeah, the Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. Okay, okay. They... Uh, I mean, all of the, again, when God works it out, he, the, last, the last place you would think of, Stalin, think whatever. We are few in number. Our country is small and due to its long border, they're very normable. No normal, regular estimation would have foreseen the outcome of the 1948 War of Independence, nor the tremendous victory of the Six-Day War. We had a student once from uh, West Point. Uh, and they said other places, they, how they, they study, they, they study different wars and how they learn from different wars, but the, the Six Day War you can't learn from. It's there's, like, it's so un... There's the story about the, um, about the uh, this AI software that they developed to see, like, to, like, to, to test war strategy. And they would put all these different strategies and battles in from wars throughout history. And they all sort of ended up the way, the, like, the, the software ended basically the same way that the, uh, the actual battle ended. But when they put in stuff from the Six Day War, the... Really it doesn't make sense. It doesn't come out. It comes out the okay, okay. There's certain rules. I then once I heard this lecture, there has to be, I don't know, a, a tank war has to be, I forget, you have to be two to one. And here we were the odds were the opposite. One to, to like the outnumbered in the airplane. It, 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 it wasn't logical. In other words, the estimation wasn't be that we would, the victory here wasn't a normal uh, occurrence, let's say, uh, outcome. All right, um, we're sounded by billions of Arabs around all the countries. Uh, and all of a sudden the liberation of vast tracts of our land, such an astounding military effect, the likes of which has never been seen, etc. Um, and here we're talking about a nation. He goes down maybe at the bottom here. Like, where lies the source of this spirit of might? 
from where do we draw the knowledge and understanding to conduct our affairs? affairs? So, how is it possible for a nation which has been divorced from its land for 2,000 years to create a thriving agriculture, etc.? Where do we uh, draw the political and diplomatic skill? Where does the spirit of might and knowledge of warfare to such an extent emanate in relation to a nation which only yesterday was a living manifestation of the terrible curse in Vayikra? And those of you that remain in the exile, I will send a faintness, a faintness into your hearts, into their hearts and the land of their enemies, and the sound of a rustling leaf shall chase them. This fear, this mentality, it wasn't just a physical destruction. We came out of the Holocaust three years before. It wasn't just the, the physical destruction. The, the morally, the, I call the, I don't know, call it the ruhani, the spiritual, the, the breakdown of the, the spirit. So how does it come out? Like he says, in a, for, a matter of years, we have an air force of such high repute, etc. So the answer, the beginning to the answer here is this verse in Yechezka that we learned not too long ago, uh, which is also the Haftarah. We didn't read it this year because it didn't come out on Shabbat, the... But the, the, usually the intermediate days of Pesach on, on Shabbat, we read the Haftarah of Yechezkel 37, the dry bones prophecy. And there it says, after he sees these bones coming back together, and um, there are bones, and then right the stages of rebirth, if you remember, the bones get together, and there's a skeleton, and then he sees the sinews and ligaments and the, the skin growing upon it, and, but still no spirit of life. It's a corpse. Now it's a body, but it's no life. It's a corpse. And then God says, I'll put my spirit in this body, in this nation, in these bones, and they'll come back to life. And then the Yechezkel, the prophet, says, what is this referring to? And God said, this is the, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And the rabbis say, like Ron Sanhedrin, he says how this is the picture of how the rebirth of the Jewish people will come back to life again after 2,000 years of exile. How like a dead body, there's a national resurrection of the dead. Can you imagine if you saw one person coming out of the grave? It would be a miracle, right? You would be amazed. You'd, wow, this is like literally a little coming out of the grave and coming back alive. When a nation, after 2,000 years, comes back to life again, stands up on its legs, like it says in Yechezkel, coming back and the different pieces and parts and coming from all over the world and the Jews and with no weapon, no this and no... And coming back to life, literally a rebirth of the resurrection of the dead, of the nation... And that some people, uh, again, don't recognize, or let's say the opposite, the positive side, that we recognize and realize the miracle, the God's uh, awakening, what it says here. I will put my spirit in you and you shall come to life. I mean, the bones are dried up and the hope is lost and it seems that that's the end of the Jewish people. I will open your graves and cause you to come out of them and I will bring you into the land of Israel, right? The graveyard is the exile. I'll take, open up your graves and bring you to the land of Israel. And, and then I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. There's a divine infusion of a new life, a new life force. We talked about the, the learned helplessness, what the men or the Eben Ezra, we saw how, uh, like the Jews coming out of Egypt, we had what he called there the slave mentality. Nefesh Fela. They had a, a slave mentality, a galut mentality. We mentioned it's not a matter of IQ or rabbinic scholarship or knowledge. When you, and when they want the Rambam and then the Guide for the Perplexed, also in section two, talks about this a slave mentality. You don't leave slaveness to a slavery. And wash your hands, the Ramam says, and become a free person. It's a whole, and a hundred, hundred years, a thousand years, and then Egypt was 200 years. We mentioned all the, in Sobibor, also the, the, the Holocaust, what happened, how they, to take away your humanity, your, that spirit of life. Here, 2,000 years of statelessness, of, non, of individuals scattered, fractured, without any fullness of life, of national life. Where does that come from? That's this re, rebirth. This national collective rebirth of putting in the infusion of the neshama. What it says here in Yechezkel, I put my spirit in you and you shall live. I'll place you in your land. There'll be this rising up of the nation. That is, and that we thank God for. After 2,000 years, there's a book of, um, I don't know, a historian of, you've heard of the Will Durant. Well, he has a 10, 12 volumes of human history. He also has a book called The Story of Philosophy. Also, he, so care, he says, so care, summarizes you, you know, human development of human thought and philosophy. And he gets to the chapter on Spinoza, and then he introduces the chapter that called the Odyssey of the Rhine, Spinoza being a Jew. So he has a little paragraph there called the Odyssey of the Jew, of the Jews. Is that Spinoza from Brazil? No, from Brazil. Amsterdam. Amsterdam. Amsterdam, right? Spinoza. You never heard of Spinoza, the philosopher? I'm talking about yeah, a few yeah, hundred years ago. Yeah. And he... He writes it, among other things there. This is before the state. He wrote this book. Uh, and he writes something like, um, he says, what 
fiction could match the reality of these people coming back to their land after 2,000 years. In other words, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't follow the laws of history. It's rise and falls of nations. They rise, they get strong, and then they fall. They don't come back again. Once they fall, that's it. There's no, uh, as we brought down, we saw on Sid Reich, Mark, uh, Mark Twain, what is the secret of their mortality in Fort Sartre, Jean Paul Sartre. Also, they don't follow the laws of, of history here. The Jewish people don't. It's the metaphysics of, uh, of the meta history. Also, Vico, one of the famous, the fathers of uh, what they call historiosophy, or his son is in English, the philosophy of history, history of philosophy, or no, philosophy of history, that there's everything that I can explain logically, but when it comes to Jewish people, it's this, um, it's beyond the, doesn't call the usual laws. People don't come back after 2,000 years, and especially the third time coming back, at exile and coming back to their land, and uh, this is before the state, Will Durant writes that this, uh, what can match the reality, what, what fiction, what science fiction can match the reality of the Jew people coming back to their land again. Historia that looks at reality and history, that it doesn't, doesn't fit in. So we'll talk about, so what does it come from? That is this uh, divine uh, inspiration, this divine spirit that when God decides, he brings the Jewish people back to the land, fulfilling that prophecy and putting the spirit of life. And now quickly, in page number four, more specifically, when the rabbis talk about that spirit, what is the source of the spirit? Where does this energy come from? What we asked before. What is, where do we draw these exceptional powers and this courage? So we said we had a courage. And amazingly, the, 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 again, people from the Holocaust, people then, how do they come and fight and become new <laughs> fighters and courageous? So the Tosfot, I don't have time to explain the whole Gemara there. In the, you see the Tosfot in Bava Metziah, page 106. There's a story, there's a case there of a shepherd... That was a, gift, a person that gave his sheep to a shepherd to watch. And the shepherd went off, to, took a break, went to town to pick up something. And meanwhile, a lion or, an, or a dove, how do you say, a lion a or a bear came and attacked the sheep. And uh, the question is the responsibility of that shepherd. He says, what can he say to his defense? He left the sheep alone and the lion came and then and killed the sheep. What could he say to his defense? Even if I was there. Right, even if I was there, I couldn't have helped him. Well, I would have fight the lion. So the Gemara says, no, we'd have a miracle. Maybe a miracle would have taken place. Like David, it says he fought the dove and the bear. Uh, the dove and the, the, dove and the, the, the lion and the, the bear, whatever. <laughs> David Amelech. So would you have had a miracle? Or like uh, Ruchana ben uh, Trajot. No, who is it? Ruchana ben Dosa. That the, the, the sheep, the goats themselves, had, you know, picked up the lions. What? Ah, okay, so that's good. We'll just read the toast for here. That in the Gemara Tanit, there's uh, this right of Chine Bendosa that he had a great miracle that the goats uh, pilled up the bears in their horns. She says, well, I'm not worthy. If you're so worthy of a miracle, ah, no, the, to the, so the shepherd says, if you, the owner, is such a so holy person, a great person, is worthy of a miracle, then it could have been like this miracle of Chine Bendosa that they, they would have protected themselves. If you think about a miracle that should have taken place, then they, they could have fought for themselves like it did with him. So he says, no, you might have had a minor miracle. So what's a minor miracle? That's what you see Tosfot explains. A minor miracle is a spirit of might and knowledge of warfare. That God would have put into you, not a supernatural miracle that you would have, whatever, but um, you, would have been, you would have gotten that spirit and able to, out of the courage, whatever, to go and know how to manipulate and maneuver and to indeed protect the sheep, the flock. So that's what's called a minor miracle. In other words, in our context, that the, the nation that was so without anything, this new spirit is a div- and indeed a divine, uh, is a miracle. It's a form that we're used to miracles that's supernatural, but there's also, uh, let's call it, like we said, natural miracles. But this is called halakhically even in this case. But the Tosot the defines it as a minor miracle, Nesa Zuta, the small miracle of getting that energy, getting that, not just one person, uh, the Jewish people, the army, the, the, it wasn't an army, we had whatever we put together to make this, you know, the Haganah, we had the different forces, but to make this new spirit, that is indeed, and the recognition of that, the awareness of that, the appreciation of that, to say thank you to Hashem on this day of uh, recognizing the, the victory, the miraculous victory against all the odds. And the rabbis, we see, we're talking about the establishing a holiday, we, on Purim, the rabbis learn out uh, from Pesach, just like we were, why do we establish a holiday on Purim? Just like the, we were saved, in Egypt, from slavery to freedom. So all the more so you have to celebrate and thank God for when you're saved from death to life. And that the rabbis point out, 
that what took place in our days, that they were, we were again on the facing uh, the verge of annihilation, the Arabs threatened and then we're ready to do that without the outnumbered, etc., etc., all that we said. And God infused us with the Spirit and did this amazing minor miracle of uh, giving us the strength and this victory. Besides which, also the thanking God for the return of the mitzvah, of settling the land, and we'll see, we'll get to the next sheet, Bezat Hashem, of the, the main ep- fulfillment of the mitzvah, of being in Eretz Israel, is to have Jewish sovereignty, Jewish independence. Like I said, that which defines the bridge, the crossing the bridge from this world to a new era, the, 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 the era of uh, the messianic era, we said, the Gemara says, and the Rambam brings it down, halacha, of entering uh, Jewish sovereignty. The Rambam says, why do we celebrate Hanukkah? I'll end with this. Chazra malchut Yisrael yetel amataim shana. The returning of Jewish kingdom for more than 200 years. And that included, for 103 years, there was the end of that, there was the Hasmonaim kingdom, but 103 years after that, or later, another 103 years, was the Herodian kingdom, which was not exactly a holy religious kingdom. He killed the rabbis and the Yanai and Herod that killed the rabbis and the scholars. This is the, and yes, the Rambam says we celebrate Hanukkah for the return of Jewish independence, as long as it lasted, for those two, for 200 years. What we say now, the returning of Jewish independence, we'll talk more, even though it's not complete, it's not perfect, but recognizing the gift that God gave us, that we didn't use it properly, we didn't yet fulfill it, the stage of the redemption we spoke about. But nevertheless, the appreciation and the thanking of God, to God, of the gratitude for what He did, for this miracle of bringing us back, and the victory, and the strength that He gave us, and yet He gave us, but all this together is the reason that we say, part of the reason that we say thank you and hallel on your Matzmu to rest our appreciation. But we'll see the sources as more to talk about. Bezat Hashem.